Well, thank you, Chair. Thank you, committee members. My name is Lily Tang Williams. And I live in Ware, New Hampshire, and I represent myself as a former Chinese immigrant from the People's Republic of China. I was born and grew up in China. Before I came to this country, I was an assistant law school professor in Shanghai. I decided to flee China, uh, flee China for America, not go to Europe, because I truly believe our founding fathers document the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. I first landed in Austin, Texas when I was about 24 years old without speaking much English. And I live in a white neighborhood, 98% white. And I went to graduate school in UT Austin, also mostly white. And I can tell you about my personal experience. Everybody was so nice and welcoming. They helped me to adapt to a new country and they offered me the free rides to go to grocery stores because I was very poor. I only borrowed $100 to come to this country. And they donated the clothing, cooking stuff, household items to me include blankets and sheets. See, my English was very poor. My classmates were very nice to me and offered me to um, borrow their notes and help me with school projects. I also met my future husband the first night in Austin, Texas. And later we married after dating for two years. His entire family members were white. They opened, welcomed me and with the warmth and with the trust, actually they just loved me. And I feel so blessed, of course, to have a, a family in America because I come here alone. I did not have anybody, any family and the friends were close to me. And so I, be honest with you, we raised three raised children, mixed race children. And uh, I lived in America now for a total of uh, um, 88, so 32 years. I have never experienced the discrimination due to my skin color or my race, except the one incident. It was a road rage insult comment uh, from a lady. Of course, I stood up for myself and she was gone. And uh, I'm leaving American dream today. Consider my humble past from a totalitarian country. And I love this country. I strongly reject critical race theory. I'm here to support this bill because this critical race theory is infecting our country now for years. I learned about history of American slavery. I also learned history about discrimination against Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans. And uh, I loved Dr. King whose famous speech, I have a dream. And since the civil rights movement, America has come a long way. I remember that so many actually and people of the color today got elected into government offices and own homes, have a businesses. And uh, I have lots of friends also from all walks of life. I do not agree America is a systemic racist country. Otherwise, why would the millions, millions immigrants want to come to this country and have come to this country from all over the world to better their lives? They wanted to come here to achieve American dream. Critical race theory is based on skin color and the race, pure and simple. It creates hatred, it creates division that our country really don't need right now. I think it's the tool to be used by the radical left to divide and conquer. I grew up during the reign of Mao, the dictator you should all know, right? I hope so. And uh, experienced his entire 10 years cultural revolution with my own eyes. I was a little child. Let me tell you, this racist theory is a technique similar to what happened to us 
during the Mao's regime, it separated citizens into two big giant groups, victims who are oppressed and, uh, and oppressors are the white people, especially white males that I happen to marry to one. And the name also expressed, I was terrified because I remember Mao used getting rid of whole, like destroy the four old campaign to basically to use the young red guards to achieve absolute power. He become a god during the Cultural Revolution control, his regime controlled 1.3 billion human lives. And he divided the citizen into 10 classes, five red, like me, red child from a worker's class, and the five blacks. You can easily find out what they are. I don't want to get into specific of those 10 classes here, mm -hmm. but he urged the red guards, those people who worship him, who were young, I leave, and who did not know the history to publicly shame and the, the black classes people have to come out to cut out, to basically denounce themselves so-called their blackness instead of whiteness and they also beat them up if they don't do criticize correctly when I saw what happened last summer in our country, months and months of riots and, and the nuding and the public and shaming people, if you don't join the new movement, some people may support the Black Lives Movement. But... Um, just like, stop for a second, please. Um, could you please wrap it up? Um, I want to keep everyone's testimony equal and you've had quite a amount of time. Testimony fascinating, you could listen to it all day, but I want to be fair. Thank you. So I wanted to just testify that uh, I witnessed 10 years cultural revolution. I don't really want that happen to our country because America is a home. We have no place to go. If we lose America as a free country, we can deal with individual cases of racism and the police brutality, but we have so much in common. As American citizens, we love this country. We want to have the best for our kids and our future. So please support this bill. And this bill is um, going to, I think, not silence the other side. We can still have discussions uh, and, and conversations, but you don't use taxpayers' money to support critical theory. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Representative Schultz. Thank you. I um, believe your husband is a state rep. Oh, no, no. <laughs> okay, no. sorry. Someone no, was we are there. new here. We just moved here from Colorado. Oh, well, uh, welcome to New Hampshire. Sorry. Yeah, one year ago. Thank not you. Not a relevant question. I apologize. That's all right. I do welcome your questions, sir. Any other questions? Thank you. That's yeah. Um, okay, uh, Ms. Clark, please. You have to unmute yourself. Hello, my name is Gabrielle Clark, and um, I have been exposed to critical race theory in my family. And um, I'll tell you about what happened with my son. My son um, was, his name is William Martin Clark. His middle name is Martin because he was born on Martin Luther King Day of that year. And earlier this year, he was asked to complete a project in his class where he had to list his, his identity, his uh, racial identity, his, uh, his religion, his sexual identity, all of those things. And because he refused, he was retaliated against. He suffered some serious um, emotional distress as have I, because he refused to be categorized as an oppressor since he is a straight white male. Since he is a straight white male, they have decided for him that he's an oppressor and he is uh, privileged. When this boy 
his father died when he was one years old. When this all happened, we were living in a motel and William was sleeping on a mat on the floor. There's nothing privileged about my son's life. And just because he's a straight white male doesn't give anybody the right to make that decision and that distinction and that determination. That is what critical race theory does. And if you, if you don't root this out right now, you will be suffering this same thing in your schools, in your jobs, and everywhere else. It is a poison. And you need to get rid of it. You can teach racial equality, and you can even, you can even decide that racial equity is, is something that you want to uh, pursue without critical race theory as the basis for doing it. You want racial equality, you want racial equity, teach the kids math. Teach the kids English. Make sure they get good jobs and they have the, have the skills to move forward in life. You do not need this nonsense. It is corrosive. It is disgusting. You should get rid of it. And I am a person of color and I am saying this. All my life, I have been able to make my own decisions and take care of my own self. And whenever I needed to, I got help because this is America. And if you need help, you get help. If you're being discriminated against, you file a complaint or you file a lawsuit or you do something about it. You do not need other people to tell you how you should or should not think or what you should or should not do. That is what critical race theory does. And it is gross. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Clark. Appreciate your testimony. Could you take a question? Representative Broda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for testifying, Ms. Clark. Can you please tell me what school um, your son attends and what town you live in, please? Thank you. You can see all of that information at schoolhouserights.org because we filed our lawsuit there. Mr. Lindsay. Hello, sorry, I was uh, figuring out Zoom on my phone for the first time. Oh, okay. Uh, unfortunately, I'm joining you from a hotel in Los Angeles today. My name is James Lindsay. I am um, an expert in critical race theory. In fact, I'm one of the very few experts in critical race theory that does not subscribe to the ideology underlying critical race theory. And I wanted to testify in support of this bill. I think this bill is a crucial maneuver for essentially every state, especially since there was an executive order of this type federally that then was rescinded by the current sitting president. I want to kind of start my testimony. I'll try to stay brief by saying that I receive thousands of messages from people all over the country because I am recognized as a kind of world level expert in critical race theory from parents of students in schools, people in workplaces begging me for solutions that they can bring to their workplaces, to their children's schools to try to deal with the problems that follow from this ideology. A lot of people don't understand critical race theory and we can talk about that briefly in a moment, but I wanna talk about the bill itself first as it's modeled after the executive order that President Trump issued in September. And it doesn't even technically ban critical race theory. It certainly doesn't ban the teaching of critical race theory. It certainly doesn't ban diversity or anti-racist or racial sensitivity training and people should be clear about that. Uh, so it's not shutting down the ability to have diversity training or education or to cover these subjects in an academic manner in school. So it should be made clear. On the other hand, it does ban things that are central to the United States. It bans, uh, or central to, the opposite of them is central to the United States. It bans racial scapegoating. It bans racial stereotyping. It bans racial discrimination. It bans naming the uh, country or state in this case as being intrinsically evil or racist or sexist. It bans the same things for sex and race, um, racial scapegoating, sex scapegoating, racial stereotyping, sex stereotyping, and discrimination for both. Uh, these are not things that we really want to try to bring back into this country. We spent a long time getting away from them. The ideology of critical race theory begins from the first assumption that it makes. This is written in all of their literature. You can read it 
for yourself, for example, in Delgado and Stefanczyk's Critical Race Theory and Introduction, which is a standard textbook in the subject, it says that it begins from the assumption that racism, and it would be parallel for sexism, is the ordinary state of affairs in society. It is the normal science of society. It's not an aberration that boils down in the name or in the words of other scholars to uh, the question is no longer did racism take place, but rather how did racism manifest in that situation? The people who are equipped to find the racism that's apparently hidden in every possible situation, every interaction, every uh, student teacher interaction, every employee interaction, every boss employee interaction, every single one of those has racism in it. The people equipped to find it are called critical race theorists. What this training or what this, this bill is supposed to ban is training people to think this way and mandating them in their workplaces and in their schools to have to think this way. This is a divisive, uh, dangerous way to reintroduce race salience and sex salience into our institutions. It's from the thousands of messages I received from, from panicked parents and employees all over the country all the time. Uh, it causes division. It causes hostile working and learning environments. It will set schools and workplaces up for um, lawsuits where they have created discrimination and they have created uh, hostile working environments. And it's virtually certain also that it will open the door to the people that are providing these trainings from be for being sued for providing a fraudulent product that does not provide uh, what it claims to provide. Uh, there are already attorneys general in some states looking into how to do that because the evidence is, on, is, is opposite of what these training materials say that they do. So in, in that regard, I'll wrap up. I think that this is a very dangerous situation that we find ourselves in in the United States and in, in the state of New Hampshire right now. And I think that it is in the best interest of every state possible to make a stand on this and say, no, we are not going to reintroduce race and sex, scapegoating, stereotyping, discrimination, or billing our nation or states or institutions as intrinsically evil, racist, or sexist. So I have to support uh, this bill as I supported um, the executive order that President Trump issued in September. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions from the committee? Representative Pearson. Thank you for taking, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for taking my question. Um, I, historically, worldwide, has there ever been a nation that has um, taught critical race theory to its people and has their and if so, what were the effects of that, if you're aware of any? Thank you for your question. Um, the answer to that question is no. Critical race theory was be, began in the 1970s, but it really was developed in the 1990s and has only come to prominence in the, in the last decade. And it is almost a wholly American invention. It was developed at Harvard Law by Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw, who you can check out the, their scholarship if you want for yourself. And the closest parallel to what critical race theory teaches and preaches that's been installed at the governmental level is the government of South Africa. You've seen, if you want, you can look up the equity task force that Governor Inslee of Washington installed, or installed in, the, um, in about a year ago, a little over a year ago in the state of Washington. And they have an entire section in which they speak that part of the goal of their task force, which is using the same ideology, is to move the government of Washington in the direction of the government of South Africa. So if you can look at what's going on in South Africa right now and think this is the direction that for my state, this is the direction for the United States, uh, that's the closest parallel that you'll find. The critical race theory is an, is an American invention. It's, it's quite new and uh, it has not yet been installed, uh, except that it has kind of taken over in places in the United States over the past, I don't know, eight months or so, pretty significantly, leading to President Trump issuing that order. Thank you. Representative Schultz, you had a question? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for taking my question. I think I know who you are. Are you the same James Lindsay that is on Twitter as at Conceptual James? Yes, that's me. Okay. Madam Chair, I know that this is going to be a difficult question, but I'm asking it since he claims to be a national expert and mean no offense to the committee in, in my question. But uh, Mr. Lindsay, isn't it true that you have been, um, uh, I guess, examined as someone who has issued death threats against the Jewish community and, and prominent Jewish activists? 
that is not relevant to this bill. And I mean, I'll speak to that because it's false. And my name is Dr. Lindsay, uh, if you don't mind. And you're a math professor, correct? Not a sociology professor? I am a PhD in mathematics who's been studying the relevant academic literature full time, 16 hours a day, most days of the week for the past three years. And isn't it true you're affiliated with a national white? Representative Schultz, I've muted you. That, that question. The answer to that question is also no. I am affiliated with absolutely nothing of the sort. I can name the organization she's probably trying to uh, insinuate bad things about to try to impugn my motives, but that organization is neither white nor nationalist. It's Madam in fact Chair, run by a half Cuban and half of its board is Asian. Thank you. Madam, Madam Chair, I just want to say that because many of the opponent or many of the proponents of this bill are claiming that those who oppose this are racist, isn't it important to understand since this is all ideologically driven, if someone is actually affiliated with a group that is believed to be by the Southern Poverty Law Center, a white supremacist group. Representative Schultz, not necessarily. And I think we will not, I do not believe that either the supporters or the proponents of this bill are racist. And I would not make that assumption. Thank you very much. May I have one moment to say something about that? Because it is germane. It's germane. Uh, yes. So it is important to understand that one of the one of the beliefs of critical race theory is that all criticism of critical race theory comes from a place of racism or white supremacy, whether that's intentional or unintentional. When it's unintentional, they call it willful ignorance. Uh, they they suggest, and I can give you a list of citations a, a, a mile long. We could talk about Barbara Applebaum's being white, being good. We could talk about Robin DiAngelo's white fragility. We could talk about uh, Allison Bailey's paper about privilege preserving epistemic pushback. The belief in critical race theory is that any disagreement with critical race theory must come from motives that uh, wish to support uh, white supremacy and racism. And in fact, they say that people who benefit from that what, by virtue of the color of their skin or because they are selling out if their race is other than, say, white or what they term white adjacent, um, have have uh, little motivation to disrupt their own racial comfort. That's their words. And therefore have a uh, strong motivation to oppose critical race theory for self-beneficial, ultimately racist reasons that help to uphold that alleged racist white supremacy uh, system that they claim is the ordinary operating system of society. So it's very important to understand that it's impossible to disagree with critical race theory uh, without being accused of being a racist or a white supremacist. And you get used to it after a while. Thank you. We will attempt not to insult anyone at this hearing. And to all the participants who are here raising their hands, I have a list of 26 people who are Hello, my name is Dr. Carlin Barasenko. I'm an organizational psychologist and I live in Merrimack, New Hampshire. I'm testifying today in strong support of HB 544. After last week's hearing, Representative Chris Schultz tweeted the following, a bunch of racists in New Hampshire are promoting a racist bill that says we should stop pointing out how dank white supremacy is. She also publicly insinuated that anyone who disagrees with her- Ms. Dr. Borisenko, I've muted you. Please do not attack members of the committee. Do not impugn their motives. Thank you. She can send us copies of that tweet, though, if she wants. What's that? She can send us copies of that tweet by yes. email if she wants. Fine. Thank you. I'd be happy to. I'm not sure if I was off mute there, but I will say I'm not impugning her motives. I am saying that this, she has made public statements in this regard, and I'm bringing it up to articulate that nothing is further from the truth about this bill. Those are lies. This bill opposes racism. It does precisely the opposite of what people like Representative Schultz are trying to get you to believe. Now, you just heard from Dr. Lindsay, so I won't repeat what he said about critical race theory, but I have been working nonstop to understand this ideology and its impact on organizations and individuals for the last two years. And here are the conclusions that I've come to. Critical race theory is dangerous and toxic. It teaches people to hate themselves and inflicts tremendous pain and guilt for things they are not responsible for. Let me be really blunt. 
critical race theory teaches people that if you were born white, you are inherently racist. And yes, Representative Schultz, that even includes you. The best-selling book, White Fragility, is one of the Bibles of critical race theory. And in it, author Robin D'Angelo, herself a white woman, confesses that she has been racist since the womb, has been racist her entire life, and will always be a racist simply because she is born white. It is not a question of if you are a racist, it is assumed. And the only question is how your racism manifests. HB 544 would specifically ban these ideas from entering into state agencies and state contractors under the guise of diversity training. Now, I'm an organizational psychologist. I do corporate training for a living. Not all diversity training is based on critical race theory. There are wonderful diversity training programs out there that have nothing to do with this ideology and would not be impacted by this bill. The Democrats who are telling people that this bill would ban diversity training are lying to you. The bill only addresses trainings that teach people they are racist because of how they were born. Let me tell you how this training manifests in organizations. They start off by segregating the white employees from all of the non-white employees. Yes, under critical race theory, segregation is a good thing. Then they make the white employees confess to their racism and sometimes even write letters of apology to non-white employees, even if their behavior has not been racist in any way. Remember, their racism is assumed because of how they were born. And if the white employees push back or refuse, or even if they just ask questions about why their organization is making them admit that they're racist, they are in very real danger of losing their jobs. So that is the choice when this training comes into organizations. You either confess that you're a racist or you lose your job. That's bad enough. But let me give you evidence and a highly practical reason to support this bill. There is absolutely no evidence that training based on critical race theory is effective. None. Zero. Zilch. And I know. I've looked. As an organizational psychologist, if something is effective in the work... Thank you, Ms. Borisenko. I think we've, we've gotten your testimony. Is there? Do you have a few seconds of highlights that you want to add? Well, I think that um, there is there is one more thing in that there is you are going to hear no testimony today that says this this training is effective. And as a New Hampshire state resident, if my tax dollars are being spent on something, I want to know that it's actually effective. So critical race theory creates more racism, not less. It is not going to make organizations fairer, more, more open, more diverse, or any of those things. It's going to do exactly the opposite. So I strongly encourage everyone to support this bill and protect the people of New Hampshire from this harmful ideology. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Madam Chair, I wasn't going to address the comments she directed at me. I did have a genuine question. Yes, if it's a question, ask it. Since this bill also addresses gender and, um, well, gender, uh, I just wanted to see if you're the same Carolyn Borisenko who wrote the article in Forbes magazine about the gender pay gap. Yes, absolutely, I am. The gender pay gap is a myth, and I am Dr. Borisenko. Thank you. That, thank you. That uh, answers the question. I call Jacob Benef. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to uh, uh, speak uh, on behalf of, in support of this bill, rather. Um, if you look at the language in the bill, it's quite clear. Uh, all it does is say that you can not uh, uh, stereotype, scapegoat, or demean individuals on the basis of race and sex. Uh, this is the basic moral takeaway. Uh, of the 14th Amendment uh, and of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, critical race theory as it's implemented in institutions um, actually does all of those things. It stereotypes, scapegoats, and demeans. It traffics in notions of race essentialism. Uh, it promotes uh, harmful and divisive stereotypes uh, based on inborn characteristics. Um, it also creates a hostile working environment and would put the state at risk of legal action. Uh, and finally, uh, I think that it's very clear that these are also violations in many cases of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, I'm the director of the Center on Wealth and Poverty at Discovery Institute. I'm a contributing editor at uh, City Journal Magazine um, and a uh, visiting fellow this year at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, I've studied critical race theory. I've done the investigative reporting. And I'd like to just share a few examples of what happens uh, in the real world 
uh, as these programs are implemented that this bill seeks to prevent. I reported on um, the Sandia National Laboratories, which produces, designs and produces the nuclear weapons arsenal of the United States government. Uh, they recently took white male executives uh, and then forced them in a training session uh, to deconstruct their white male identity. It said that being a white male is analogous to the KKK, to white supremacists and to lynching, and then forced them to apologize uh, for their inborn traits uh, and write letters of apology uh, and in the abstract to women and people of color uh, for the way that they were born. Um, in education, these programs are deeply harmful. I've reported on recently uh, a story where first graders in California were forced to deconstruct their racial and sexual identities and then rank themselves according to their power and privilege, telling for some first graders that they were the oppressors and some first graders that they were the oppressed. I've also reported uh, on a story recently in New York City where a public middle and high school sent a email to white parents telling them that uh, they had to do white identity work um, and that the highest goal as a white person should be to become, become a quote, white traitor and eventually advocate for quote, white abolition. Uh, this is language that applied to any other group uh, would be considered a euphemism uh, for elimination. Um, this kind of rhetoric is deeply divisive. It hurts people. And, and finally, uh, it's actually in, in practice deeply uh, condescending and, and patronizing towards uh, people of color. Um, critical race theory argues in many training sessions that I've documented and reported on that traits of rationalism, individuality, logic, and punctuality are manifestations of white supremacy, uh, implying that uh, African Americans and Latinos, Asians and Native Americans uh, are somehow not able to exhibit the qualities of rationality or punctuality uh, or even logic. Um, this kind of ideology is deeply corrosive at its core. It's fundamentally a racist. And again, the language of this bill says you cannot be racist or sexist. You cannot de degrade, demean or stereotype people on the basis of race or sex. Uh, anyone who votes for this bill uh, would be basically saying that we support and will, will allow uh, racism and sexism to proliferate through the institutions. Um, it's a very simple moral question. Uh, don't be uh, kind of taken astray uh, by the very verbose academic language of some of my uh, opponents supporting or uh, opposing this bill. Um, it's very simple. Look what happens in practice um, and uh, please stand up. Uh, for the right thing in defense of civil rights, uh, in defense of logic and rationality, uh, and in defense of treating people equally, no matter how they were born. Thank you. Are there any questions for the Mr. You can follow along. That would be great. So my, my, first, my first thought uh, is just the, my background is I'm a former public high school teacher. I used to teach American government and Afro-Asian cultural studies. Uh, I'm a former ranking member of the House Brookline Cooperative School District Budget Committee. I'm a multi-generational uh, uh, member of a mixed race family. Uh, my children are also part Abenaki and Cherokee. And uh, I've received uh, public service awards in over two states, including JCs and from the town of Hollis. So uh, my first slide was anti-discrimination versus critical race theory. And I, I rise in support of uh, HB 544. Uh, discrimination is discrimination and a theory is an unproven thought. And those are the takeaways I want you to have for, uh, for anti-discrimination and critical race theory. So are we there yet? Well, I have friends who were freedom riders in Mississippi back in the 1960s and they were held hostage by the Jim Crow types for several days before they were released. And I remember my father's best friend's family when we were sitting vigil for Father Jim Feeney who was held hostage when Robert Kennedy from the White House as the Attorney General called our friend's house and said that our friend had been released. So if the 60s was about anything, it was about what Martin Luther King said, I dream of a day when my four children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That is really the essence of what I think anti-discrimination and critical race theory is all about. Now, are we there yet? Well, who, maybe I'm not the best to say, but ask Alveda King, Dr. Ben Carson, Michael Jordan, 
financier Charles Payne, Candace Owens, actor Morgan Freeman, and Justice Clarice Thomas, if we are that virtually all of them came from humble means and rose to what they rose to, I don't have to tell you. So uh, I want to keep in mind that that to me is the essence and the benchmark of what we should be doing, the I have a dream statement of Dr. King. Uh, here in Hollis, we have a DEI committee, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. And basically the message is to get woke and have it attended some of the, me the meetings and spoken to some of those who are members. It's clear to me that empirical data is being replaced by theory and replace, replaced by consensus building. Uh, that's one of the real drawbacks of uh, the critical race theory is that they pit equity versus equality, equity being equal outcome and equality basically being equal opportunity. In fact, the committee that's here in Hollis, it's actually with the co-op, Hollis Brookline, SAU 41, actually is redefining equity to mean equal opportunity. So, you know, words mean things as they're written in the dictionary, whether you go to Wikipedia or whether you go to Britannica or you go to Webster, and equity means equal outcome. Equality of opportunity means just that. So there's a, a, a clear dichotomy between outcome versus opportunity. And, and they used, and I'll use the analogy of running a race. If it's a hundred meter race, you all start at the, at the start line, the shot goes off, people run down the hundred meters, then they finish first, second or third or whatever. But in an equity world, everybody finishes at the same time. And they use the term building equity. Building equity is critical race theory. And it's, 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 not a, it's not an effort of discovery, it's an effort of advocacy. Now, moving forward, when you invoke the strategies of the diverse and equity and inclusion committees and critical race theory, you basically look at everything through a prism of racism. So all of society is viewed for that prism of racism, personal and group identity is viewed that way. And the groups are defined as, as, as the dominant versus the subordinate. So you have the oppressors and you have the victims. And again, looking through that prism, all of our laws, institutions, and history are inherently racist. The further these inequalities must be corrected through equity, and that's the distribution of wealth and resources. And in that, the norms of our society changed. Our society no longer is a meritocracy. In that prism of racism view, public and private bonds are weakened and education is not one of discovery as in a Socratic method, but indeed indoctrination. And one of the remarks mentioned by some of the earlier speakers having worked uh, beyond teaching in IT and contract law, I'm not an attorney, but I, I've worked in them. There are several opportunities to show where there's equal opportunity in, in, in the in the companies and agencies that might do business with the state. And that's done today through EEO. So there's many proven models to do that. So when you look at, uh, when you look at the critical race theory further, white people foster differences that cre have created this inequality and they're, they're, they're the boogeyman. Their, their inequalities are systemic and they're ones of subjugation and they create poverty. And I said to the, the, the SAU and the co-op here in Hollis Brookline, if indeed we have systemic racism in, in this town, or for that matter in this state, then where are the incident reports that have been filed through the schools? Where are the police reports? Where have the people been using the RSAs to correct these inadequacies? Because clearly they would be if they had been occurring and if they've been systemic. And if there is not this data, then then you have to intellectually reject this because these events have not been filed and actions have not been taken in a legal manner, which there are many provisions for and that we would encourage them to do if indeed they were real. Uh, the end game is to normalize this whole methodology of advocacy and, and pushing theories. And uh, you know when you look at having studied Mao and the Red Guards, the Alinsky strategies, BLM and Antifa, which are groups. BLM is a corporation, which actually is trying to destroy the nuclear family. Their strategies are divide and conquer. They're about reparations and they're about unlearning. So uh, I had some slides, please take a look at them and show one of the questions that came out before.
critical race, race theory is actively being taught. There was a uh, recently a uh, a uh, school district, the uh, Meyer Holt School District in Cupertino, San Jose, where they advocated power and privilege being identified by whether, and this is third graders, are you white, are you middle class, are you cisgender, are you cisgender male, are you educated, are you able-bodied? Those are all identities that hold power and privilege of one over the other. And that was in the curriculum. Likewise in Hollis, I included a summary of a letter that our uh, petition group here in Hollis to get to stop critical race theory took notes going as far back as October 2020, where they talked about white people being the subjugators. And I quote, white people are the only ones who can be racist. White, white people treat people very badly because they have power. They cause racism. They created slavery. They brought it to this country. And this is directly from a letter from a Hollis grade two and three parent, because this transcended the year uh, of a, a parent in Hollis. And I can send you the letter with the permission of the author with their name and, uh, and their, his wife's name redacted and ask him to uh, speak to the committee in private because he's, af he's afraid of repercussions against his family and against his child. So in summary, the prism of identity the prism of identity, politics, and race. I ask you intellectually, will it nurture and teach and foster self-confidence of our children and of our, of our peer groups, whether professional or otherwise? Will it bring us together? Will it foster confidence in our community? And I, I think the answer to those things is clear as this is a divisive exercise at its core. And I also wanna stress from an educational standpoint, as I also made this presentation to SAU 41, Will it improve our math and reading scores? Here we are in Hollis. We still, we, we still only have a 32% proficiency in, uh, in math. Um, pardon me. We have 32% of our students who are not proficient in, in mathematics at grade level in the high school, and 14% are not proficient in reading. And I think part of this is an obfuscation of responsibility from an educational process standpoint, because it takes our focus off the core responsibility of basic skills in education. So again, I ask you to vote against discrimination, okay? I ask, discrimination is discrimination. And I ask you to choose to support HB 544, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Davidson. I'll take any questions, please. Senator Roy, do you have a question? Oh, okay. I'm from Ms. Schultz. No, thank you. It was a mistake. Someone raised their hand by mistake. Melissa B. from Concord. Oh, Madam Chair, I did have a question. Yes, I Representative mean, Schultz. You can choose not to call on me, I guess, but my question is, you mentioned that there are a lot of school systems, etc., that you've raised this issue with. Did you ask anyone that is a person of color their view on this? Well, actually, I didn't say that I raised it up in many school systems. I went through discovery and I, I noted that the, uh, to answer your question, I think where you're going with this, the Meyer Holt School in Cupertino, San Jose, California is 70% Asian and a large majority of those individual parents, 70 percentile, uh, are uh, foreign born and they're immigrants to this country. And it was they that raised this up at the Meyer Holt School and uh, where the advocate who was against uh, the critical race theory, who is an Asian woman, spoke very strongly, and in fact was on Fox News speaking against the slides that I forwarded to you that were used in the curriculum. Okay. So you ask no person of color. Thank you. Oh, well, <laughs> Madam Chairman, I don't want words put into my mouth. Uh, there were actually uh, people of color on the, on the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee uh, in Hollis, Brookline, that uh, I made my presentation to. So that's not correct. And moreover, I can speak to my niece, who is a mixed race a police officer in Virginia Beach, Virginia, or any number of other cousins and blood relatives, if that's important to you, Ms. Schultz. Thank you. 